passage from the story of Job. This is Job 28, 12 through 28. And Job is speaking of wisdom. Wisdom. Where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Mortals do not know the way to it. And it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it's not in me. The sea says, it's not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold. And silver cannot be weighed out as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The chrysolite of Ethiopia cannot compare with it nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? And where is the place of understanding? It's hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. God understands the way to it. And he knows its place, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and portioned out the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out, and he said to humankind, Truly, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Now Paul writes a letter to the Colossians. This is the first 14 verses of that letter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world. So it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And for this reason, since the day we heard it, we've not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power. May you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom 
of the beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. May God bless to our understanding these portions of Holy Scripture. Today's sermon is titled, Bearing Fruit. Colossae was a city in the Roman province of Asia, now western Turkey. It was located in the upper Lycos River Valley, about 110 miles east of Ephesus. Two other cities were located close by. Laodicea was 10 miles west of Colossae, and Hierapolis, 12 miles northwest. 500 years before the time of Christ, these three cities in the Lycos Valley were important centers of commerce. Big towns. Colossae was especially known for its wool working and cloth dyeing, cloth dyeing industries. In fact, the HarperCollins Bible Dictionary tells us that the dark red wool cloth known as Colossinum was widely known. But, you see, as with many of the textile centers in our own parts of the country, Colossae suffered decline. By the time of Paul's writing, it had been outstripped by its neighbors, Laodicea and Heropolis. Paul had no way of knowing, of course, that Colossae was to be severely damaged by an earthquake several years after he had written to the Christian church located in that community. See, I think it's fair to say that Colossae was little more than a backwater town at the time that this letter was written. It disappeared. Colossae disappeared as a community during the latter days of the Roman Empire. And though its probable site was located in 1835, it has never been excavated by archaeologists. HarperCollins tells us that it became a quarry after the fall of the Roman Empire. Interestingly, Paul did not found the church at Colossae, nor had he ever even visited the town. In Acts 19.10, we have a hint as to the beginnings of this church. Having been forcibly removed from the synagogue in Ephesus, Paul met with his disciples in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Acts 19.10 reads, This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. It's likely, you see, that some of these disciples took the word of the Lord back to their hometowns, and they founded Christian churches there. Colossians 1, 7 and 8 suggests that the church in Colossae was founded by one such disciple, a man called Epaphras. Paul calls Epaphras a beloved fellow servant and a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. At the time of the writing of this letter, it's probable that St. Paul was in prison in prison in Rome, awaiting his final trial and his death by beheading at the hands of the Emperor Nero. See, these were very difficult times for Paul. He knew that his life of service on earth was likely coming to an end. And yet he took the time to write this beautiful letter to a little backwoods town he'd never even seen on the far fringes of the Roman Empire. Why? We must ask, why? Why did Paul bother to write this letter? He didn't know these people. He'd never visited Colossae. 
And Colossae was not a big, important city like Ephesus or Philippi or Thessalonica or Rome. And besides, Paul had plenty of problems of his own. He was in prison. He was captive to a maniacal emperor who would likely execute him, just as that emperor Nero had executed many others of his enemies, including members of his own family. Nero hated the Christians. He blamed the Christians without cause, mind you, without cause. He blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome. They were his scapegoats. And Nero seemed to enjoy persecuting them. So again, why? With all the troubles he was facing in Rome, why did Paul take time out to write from prison to Christians in an insignificant little town like Colossae? Because they were not insignificant. That's why. They were not insignificant. No gathering of Christians is insignificant to God. Backwater town, declining economy, never been visited by the apostles. It doesn't matter. Every Christian church is valued by God. Every Christian church. Paul knew this just as we know it. This is certainly one of the reasons he took time took time to encourage the Colossians, even during his own time of suffering and need. And what a letter. We'll study it in detail over the next few weeks. What a letter. Just look at the opening 14 verses. Our New Testament lesson for today. Paul salutes the Colossians for their faith. And he wishes them the grace and peace of God. He praises the church in Colossae for bearing fruit. And he prays for them unceasingly, and he reminds the Colossians, and us who even now are reading this letter, that through Jesus Christ, God has redeemed us, rescued us from sin, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. And oh, how we need to hear these words today. Wouldn't you like to receive a letter like this from St. Paul? Wouldn't it be something if the Lord's Apostle had written this letter to, to us right here in Union Springs? You know, that is, in my opinion, the reason, a key reason why this short letter is included in the canon of Holy Scripture today. I believe that's why God saw to its preservation. The town of Colossae is long gone. But God's love for all of us backwater Christians is as strong today as it was when the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write the church in Colossae lo these two millennia ago. We need to hear these words. We need to reflect on them. We need to realize that God is speaking to us. Right here, right now. Through Paul's letter to the Colossians. To all the little churches in small town USA and across the world, now hear this. God loves you. God loves you. As his life's work, Eugene Patterson has translated the entire Bible from its original languages into modern day English. His purpose is to let us hear how God is speaking to us right here and now, right here where we live and work and worship. And I've gone a little step further and modified Peterson's translation so we can have the full impact of these words from God through St. Paul to us. So listen to this modern version of the opening verses of a letter God desperately wants us to hear. 
I, Paul, have been sent on special assignment by Christ as part of God's master plan. Together with my friend Timothy, I greet the Christians and stalwart followers of Christ who live in Union Springs. May everything good from God, the Father, be yours. Our prayers for you are always spilling over into thanksgivings. We can't quit thanking God, our Father, and Jesus, our Messiah, for you. We keep getting reports on your steady faith in Christ, our Jesus, and the love you continuously extend to all Christians. The lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack. Tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taut by hope. The message is as true among you today as it was when you first heard it. It doesn't diminish or weaken over time. It's the same all over the world. The message bears fruit. It's larger and stronger just as it has in you. From the very first day you heard and recognized the truth of what God is doing, you've been hungry for more. It's as vigorous in you now as when you learned it from our friend and close associate, the Reverend Timothy Root. Way back in 1853, 168 years ago, mind you, at the founding of your church. The Reverend Root was one reliable worker for Christ, a missionary to the Cherokees, a pastor in Stanford, Kentucky, Centerville and Tuskegee, and your founding pastor. The Reverend Root later served as a chaplain during the war between the states. I could always depend on him. He's the one who told us how thoroughly love had been worked into your lives by the Spirit. Be assured that from the first day we heard of you, we haven't stopped praying for you, asking God to give you wise minds and spirits attuned to His will, and so acquire a thorough understanding of the ways in which God works. We pray that you'll live well for the Master, making Him proud as you work hard in His orchard. As you learn more and more how God works, you will learn how to do your work. We pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives. It's the strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy, thanking the Father who makes us strong enough to take part in everything bright and beautiful that He has for us. God rescues us from dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. He set us up in the kingdom of the Son He loves so much. The Son who got us out of the pit we were in, got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep repeating. You see, thus does St. Paul begin his letter to the Christians in Colossae and Union Springs and small towns everywhere. Make the Master proud of you as you work hard in his orchard. Keep on bearing fruit as the message, the gospel, grows larger and stronger in you. Now Paul is here, of course, echoing the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we find them in John 15, 1 through 11. Listen to Jesus' own instructions to his disciples. Jesus says, I am the true vine, my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. 
You've already been cleansed by the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I've said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be complete. In his marvelous little book, Secrets of the Vine, Bruce Wilkinson summarizes three lessons Jesus is teaching us in this passage first. If your life consistently bears no fruit, God will intervene to discipline you. Two, if your life bears some fruit, God will intervene to prune you so you will bear more fruit. And third, if your life bears a lot of fruit, God will invite you to abide more deeply with Him. It's St. Paul's desire, the desire of our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, that we abide deeply in God's love, so that our joy thereby may be complete. Notice how Paul pleads with God that our joy may be complete through the bearing of much fruit. In his prayer for us, Colossians 1, 9 through 12, Paul asked God for four things on our behalf. One, we may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Two, We may live lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, as we bear fruit in every good work. And three, we may be made strong with all the strength that comes from God's glorious power. And four, we may be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. To all of us Christians everywhere, even in little towns like Colossae and Union Springs, Paul shouts out the gospel to us with joy so that our joy may be complete. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Alleluia. May God's name be praised. Let us pray. Almighty God, you call your church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. Help us so to proclaim the good news of your love that all who hear it may turn to you Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. May the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, the Holy Spirit keep you, that you may live in the faith, bound in hope and grow in love, both now and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. 
Happy Mother's Day.